today about one of my favorite my favorite subjects, submitting your work to literary journals. Um, and I have a fancy PowerPoint. So let me see if I can share my screen, hang on. Okay, can everybody on Zoom see this screen? And you can all hear me okay, great. Okay, all right, so I have <clears throat> called this talk Building the Callus on Submitting Your Work to Literary Journals. What the heck does that mean? Hmm, why is this moving? <laughs> Hold on, there we go. Hmm. Okay, so what's a callus? You all know what a callus is. It's a thickened layer of skin. You know, if you work with your hands, right? Often on the hands or feet, like maybe if you go running on the beach without shoes, um, that gets thick where there's friction. And I always think of this, this is the image in my mind when I think about submitting work to journals because you have to keep doing this friction, sending the work out into the world. And I'm sorry, getting it returned to you as a rejection, most likely, often. Um, but you have to keep doing that. And the more you do it, the thicker your skin gets and the less it feels terrible to get those, that response back. So I was very lucky to have a professor when I was an undergraduate who taught me how to do this. And although the submission world and literary journal world has changed so much since I was an undergraduate, the one thing that I keep from that lesson is you have to kind of make it into just a, you're like a machine. You get, you get, you send the work out, you get the work back, you send it right back out again, right? So you just keep doing it and it just becomes kind of a thing that you do outside of yourself, right? Because ego is so much part of what we do and how we, we, how attached we feel to our work. That's true for all of us, no matter where we are in, you know, in our writing life. So it's a buffer. How is this working? There we go. Okay. So why would you want to do this? Um, presumably you are all writers because you want to reach readers. And that is the way we reach readers. And we all probably imagine ultimately the book that we want with our name on the spine. But before you can have the book, you have to have the publications in literary journals first. So that's where you reach readers. And that can either be in print or in many, many, many online, um, online venues, online journals. You might also be hoping to build a professional portfolio. If for instance, you hope to be, or you become um, an assistant professor somewhere and you're hoping to get tenure down the line, you have to build up a, a portfolio of these publications each year, okay? Um, and then finally, it's just really to feel the satisfaction of seeing something you worked so hard on come to life. I mean, if you've had this experience already, you know what it feels like to look at your poem or your story with your name right there at the top of it. It feels, if there's nothing like it, truly, okay? Okay, so when should you submit your work? Um, and I'm, I'm, this talk is, is working on the assumption that you want to submit, submit your work. So we can talk a little bit later about why you might not want to. Um, but if you're thinking about it, the when is after after you have carefully crafted that story, that essay, those poems, and revised them and revised them and revised them some more, right? You wanna be sending out your most polished work. Um, and that comes, you know, you get feedback initially from your peers in, in workshop, but I don't recommend sending that piece right out into the world. It probably needs to marinate a little bit. You probably need to sit with it and maybe come back to it after some days, some weeks even, maybe some months. I would recommend having a trusted source for feedback, whether you're in a workshop in an MFA program or afterwards when you're out in the world and you hopefully will retain some of your connections here and have readers that you can still trust. Important, you have to identify the appropriate venues for your work. And this is both incredibly overwhelming at this moment in the 21st century because there are so many journals but it's also easier than it ever has been to find them because of the internet. 
So, whoops, let me move these. Let me move the screen down here. There we go. Whoops, back me up. All right. So before you are ready to submit, um, you have to read deeply and widely in the literary journal world. And your goal is to identify the journals that you think are a good fit for your work, okay? And I want you to go into this thinking, instead of with the mindset of, oh, I would, I would be happy to publish my work in any place that would take me, I want you to think of it more like how we think of like a job interview. You want fit, you want, you want to, they want you as much as you want them. They can't exist without you and your work. So the thing is to find the place that really will be a good home for your piece that you care so much about and that you're gonna be proud of later, right? Um, it might be important to you, and this, is a, this part of it is a, a larger conversation that we can talk about over the course of all of SCW if you want to, but the question of payment for literary journals, two, two types of payment, the payment that you make as a writer to submit your work is called a reading fee. These are controversial and they are ubiquitous. They are almost all journals, including the Fourth River, which is ours, asks for a two to three dollar reading fee to, um, to read your work. What is that for? Mostly it's to cover the cost of paying for a submittable account. Submittable is the, um, is the, uh, the platform that we use to, to collect work from submitters and it costs something. So most journals are trying to offset that. Um, you will occasionally come across a journal that will have what seems like an outrageous submission fee, something like $20 narrative magazine. I, I, you can do what you want, but I think that's a scam. I think that is no way to treat your readers, um, especially when you're not getting something really substantial back. And again, this is like, we're off on a tangent. So I'm gonna try to keep this, um, keep this focused right here for now. So the reading fee, it's a thing, it's out there. You should know about it and not surprised by it. Um, you can do something like you could budget for yourself. You could say, I can afford, you know, $15 in reading fees a month. And that's what you just say. This is part of my life as a writer. I will spend $15 submitting every month. You might not want to do that. And there are journals that expressly do not ask for a reading fee. Barrel House is one of them. Connected to that, journals that pay you for your work. Now, this is tricky, right? We want to be paid for our work. Um, and in the writing world, you know, there is money to be made but not at the literary journal level, unfortunately, usually, unless you're in a sort of a top tier. Um, most journals, including the Fourth River, pay in contributors' copies. So that means if your piece is accepted, you probably are gonna get one or two copies of the journal sent to you for, you won't have to pay for them. But that might not be enough for you. And you might say, no, I want to be acknowledged. I want to be paid for my work and my time. Um, and so you might want to look for journals that have at least a small honorarium attached to their to, to an acceptance. So I'll use Barrel, Barrel House a minute ago as an example. They do not have a reading fee and they pay you 50 bucks if you get your piece accepted. Okay. Um, right here on this slide, I have listed um, linked to Trish Hopkinson's blog. Trish Hopkinson is just this wonderful literary citizen out in the world who maintains this blog. And um, it is, I'm not gonna click on it right now, but you can go to it. And she has all of these resources. Like there's a resource for emerging poets. Like they get really specific, but she always has a list on there of journals that have no fees to submit or journals that have no fee and they pay, right? So I would really recommend that you go through her, her resources, especially if this is an important part of the submission process for you. journals, that it's super easy, it's easier than ever to find them, and that is really true. And I've got a couple of different places I'm going to show you here. Um, newpages.com, Poets and Writers, duotrope.com, and Submittable are like sort of a big four in my mind. Um, and then you can also find these journals if you're a social media user. Oftentimes journals will have active feeds, they'll put out calls for submission on Facebook, Twitter, wherever you are.
also be involved with literary journals and they might also be a good view. But let's focus now on these, um, these sort of big four. And hopefully these links are gonna work. Oh boy, okay, let's see. Yes, trustworthy, take us there. No? Hmm, okay. Mm -hmm. There we go. Okay, great, just took a minute. So this is new page. Overwhelming itself, it's a sort of clearinghouse for all sorts of information. Um, you can find, you can find reviews, calls, tests, and submissions. If a journal is looking for, you know, plants, you might find it here. Um, some more information about bookstores, et cetera. So if you go down though to on this left-hand um, margin, you can see a list of literary magazines. What's the matter, Joe? It's not showing for the guy, for the, sorry, Zoom folks. Oh, this is a pain. I'm sorry, Zooms, Zoomers, hold on. Okay, now I have to reshare. This is a pain. Is this supposed to happen like this? I don't know. I have to tell, how do I do that, Matthew? Share new screen at the top. Where? New share. New share. Click new share. Okay, okay, I just learned something. Thanks, Matthew. Okay, so can, Zoom, can you see this now? New pages? Okay, great. So you can go to this, this link over here, literary magazines or even the big list of lit mags and click on it and it will show, hopefully, oh, it's taking so long. It's working. Well, while it's grinding through, there'll be big Okay, Zoom, can you still see that? Okay, so as I said, alphabetical, a lot of them have little profiles, give you a little sense of what, they, um, what they're looking for in their um, journal. Um, it's pretty self-explanatory. As I said, they will all link you both to a profile on, on new pages, and then also there'll be a way to get from there to the actual website of the journal. Okay, all right, Matthew, I'm gonna try this now. New share, back to PowerPoint. Did it work, Zoom? Can you, see? yes. Okay, and I gotta keep doing this, great. All right, oh, what happened? Let's try this again. Hmm, sorry, gang, hang on. New share. What is happening? Where do I do that? Small. Uh-huh, okay. I'm learning, I'm old. I'm from the dinosaur era. Okay, thanks, Matt. You're um, I'm not going to go to Poets and Writers because it's the same kind of thing. It's, Poets and Writers is a wonderful resource. It's a magazine that you could subscribe to. It's a hard copy, but it also has a wonderful web presence with all sorts of, you know, resources there, including what I just showed you. Um, we're going to go to Submittable a little bit later because I'm going to demonstrate something. But again, Submittable is the, it's, it's the um, platform that most literary journals in this country use to collect work. And as a writer, you do not have to pay for um, any kind of subscription or membership to Submittable. It is free for you to use it. The, the, the fee comes in when you, 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 know, you have to pay the $3 fee for the journal or um, the, peak, the, the fee is on our side, on the user's side the, as a journal. So Duotrope though is worth, um, is worth looking at. So I wanna show you this. Um, in a minute, I clicked it, let's see, I wish this was more simple.
What, what? Okay, hold on, new share. There it is. A pain. <laughs> ah! Hold on. All right. Zoom, can you see this? All right. So now we're going to try this part. Who knows it's going to work? Let me tell you about Duo, Duo Trip, what it is first. It's, it's my favorite tool on the internet for writers. And it does cost $5 a month to have a membership, a subscription. And it is, I think, worth it. It's two things, two really powerful things. First, it's a, um, it's a, a way to search for venues, for publications that you might be interested in publishing with. They also have just instituted a way to search for literary agents, which is not something that I have spent a lot of time looking through, but it's worth mentioning to all of you because there might be some of you out there who are interested in that. Um, so, and it's very powerful in its granularity. You can really find your search terms um, super, super specific. And the other thing that it's really super useful for is it's a submission tracking system for you to use. And I have been using it for like 10 years, probably at least. Um, and I'm gonna try to sign in to show you my account so you can see what it looks like. Zoom can, Zoom, can you still see this? Okay. Can you still see it? Okay. So this is my control panel. Um, and I will show you first what it looks like to, um, to find, if you want to search for something. So there's a search bar up here. And if you want to search for publishers, okay, this, is, this defaults right to nonfiction because it's what I've used most of the time lately but you can switch to art even. And this is what I'm talking about in terms of that, um, that refining of, of, uh, of you know, topics for search terms. So you can pick a style, literary, a topic, children and family, a temporal language, I have an essay. Um, if I want payment, I have the option of saying token, semi-pro or pro. I'm not gonna click that right now. Um, submission types, either postal or electronic. Electronic is what most of us use these days. Um, let's see, accepts reprints, accepts simultaneous submissions. We'll get to those terms in a few minutes and you can keep going, but I'm gonna stop here and, and just hit the search and see what comes up. So it, because I was so specific about it being children and family, it's really given me just a few. Um, literary Mama, Raising Mothers, Survivor Lit. I know Literary Mama, I've published there several times. So let's have a look. If you click there, you get Literary Mama's whole profile. And it's quite a lot of very useful information. It'll give you just a synopsis on top. It'll give you over here, you can get to their website. Um, it'll tell you what, if they're open, it'll tell you whether they pay. Um, It'll tell you what kind of submissions they accept. And then down here, this is really helpful too. These are, this is sort of statistics to tell you basically how long should I wait? Should I expect to wait for a response? So um, come, it's like a 15 day, a max of 136 days. Um, how many things have been rate is so 9.38 percent of submissions are accepted at literary mama which is actually kind of high um and 87.5 percent are rejected um and then you know here are non-responses and this is all user generated statistics so you have to input this stuff in order to get this back um this is nice because you can go down there if you say well you know i want to send my work to more than just one place we'll talk about that in a minute too where else might i send this essay about motherhood and gardening. And oh, the mom egg review. People have also submitted to Bitter Oleander and the Rumpus. Um, and members have also had their work accepted by Literary Mama and, I don't know, OK Donkey or something. And then it'll list, it'll list um, submissions that you have um, in the past 
uh, you sent to this market. So I sent both of these pieces, you can see in 2010 and 2012, they were both accepted. So it's a lot of really powerful information um, to search through. Anybody have any questions about that? Or maybe we should wait till the end so I can get through this stuff. The other thing I wanna show you, is I'll go back to my, um, to my submission, my, my, what do you call it, dashboard. And I'm gonna go to my submission tracker. So right now, if I scroll down, you can see these are the only three pieces that I have out being considered on the market right now, okay? Um, and you have to enter all of this. And again, when I demonstrate a submission in a bit, I'll show you how to do that. But right now I wanna show you, so I'm gonna click check all, and I'm gonna click show, and hopefully this will, so do you see this? There are, this is a, and why is this important? And you can see her, um, over the years, um, timely and of um, of import while you're in the submission phase is you have to track your submissions so that you know where they are. And this is because if you submit your work to more than one place, which is called a simultaneous submission, and um, you get accepted at one of them, you have to go back and withdraw it from the other markets. And if you don't have a system to keep track of that, you're not going to know where to withdraw it from. And that can get you into hot water with editors because it's unlikely, it's, it's like, you know, sort of a lightning strike to have the same piece accepted at the same time by two different places, but it does happen. And if you haven't managed to withdraw it, you can, you know, you come, you come away with egg on your face. Does that make sense? Okay, so I really, really, really love Duotrope and I recommend it. Um, let's see, is this gonna work again? Did this work, Zoom? Are we the PowerPoint? Okay, all right. So I just mentioned this, there are some terms that you should know um, that you'll encounter when you're submitting sort of lingo. And the reason of it, because it, the reason for this is because it takes a long take, I'm sorry, up to a year sometimes to hear back from some of these places. Can you imagine? I mean, you'd never get any of those writers. But three different. The two places. And editors expect this. They will say in their, in their guidelines, usually, they will say, um, please let us know in your cover letter that this is simultaneously submitted. But to be honest, most of them assume that anyway at this point, okay? And that's that word withdraw. There's a way to withdraw um, your work, whoops, when um, usually the, the withdraw button is through submittable. We'll look at that in a few minutes. Make sure that you do that. Um, there are still some journals out there that don't allow simultaneous submissions. And to me, they're still stuck in a... In poems to just them at one at a time are Three Penny Review and Thrush Poetry Journal. Three Penny will turn your stuff around in three days. Three days. So will Thrush. Very, very, very fast. Um, and I don't think that's because they're not reading it. I just think that they have figured out, in, Th in Thrush's case, her who so she doesn't have to confer with an editorial board or anything. It's just her journal. Um, 
so I will have no problem sending my best work first to three pen, and then I get the rejection from them, the thrush, and Helen will reject me, and I'll bring it back, and take my next move, and pick out a few other journals. So um, you don't have to you don't have to play that game. I, I think I think it's for editors at this point. Is that usually includes your website or blog and social media. Do published it in your undergraduate literary journal, like at Chatham, we have the minor bird. That is, that's an exception because that's a closed audience. That is not a national or an international audience. That's only for Chatham or only for, you know, Westcon or something like that. So those, those pieces you can go ahead and send out um, if you like. Multiple submissions means sending more than one piece to the same journal during a submission period. This is frowned upon. So you can't send, you know, two stories to Fourth River during our summer reading period. You're going to have to send one and then wait and send another one in the next reading period. And that's basically to manage submissions because most journals are just drowning in them for the most part. Okay. Okay, so here's an important thing that I wish that I knew earlier, and I made this mistake and still regret it. So you've, de you've identified some journals that you wanna send your poems to, and you've decided you're gonna send this packet of three poems to three different places. The New Yorker, aim high. The Fourth River, aim good. And the Bologna Sandwich Review, which is made up. Hold on and ask yourself, are you going to be equally happy if your piece appears in any of those journals, right? So you'd be super happy with the New Yorker or the Bologna Sandwich Review. I'm not knocking the Bologna Sandwich Review here, folks, but I'm pointing out something that is just a fact. The New Yorker is a prestigious journal. It's a career-making journal. The Bologna Sandwich Review, which does not exist, <laughs> Is, a, is just a, a startup. Some grad students who just got to finish with their MFA are really inspired and want to put work out into the world. And this is their first issue. And they're going to take your work. They are going to see your good work and say, damn, this is excellent. I can't wait to publish this. And when that happens, you're going to have to say to yourself, oh, um, but I really wanted the New Yorker or I really wanted the Fourth River even. Guess what? You can't, you have to be in good faith. You have to give your work to the Bologna Sandwich Review and forever wonder whether the New Yorker would have taken it. That is part of being a grown up in the publishing world. It's part of being a literary citizen. Um, and I have done this to myself. There is a, there is a series of poems that it, it's, in a, it's in a fine journal, but I still say to myself, I should have, I should have been more careful with where I tried to send it. So just, I wish someone had told me this in the beginning and now you know, okay? All right. So remember the old adages. Maybe you know, know what adages are. A bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. Do you know what this means? You ever heard your grandmother say that? It means, you know, be happy with the thing you have in front of you. The acceptance from the bologna sandwich review is a real and tangible and actual thing. Whereas the acceptance from the New Yorker is this like fantasy still that may or may never come to fruition. It's the two birds in the bush. Also, these are my adages, never ever respond to a rejection. Never, ever, ever respond to a rejection. Not even to say, thank you. <laughs> Just don't respond and definitely don't respond with anger. This happens all the time. It happens all, the, it has happened at the Fourth River. Um, it, ha it happens in every journal I've ever been part of, and it's horrible, and it makes you look bad as a writer, and editors talk to each other, and they times where they say, yep, this guy did me too, and let's not publish him anymore. Finally, to quote my friend Dave Housley of this process, go into good faith, act good faith, and all will be well. 
how long do I have to wait to hear? As I said a minute ago, it is not uncommon to wait up to some time longer for some of the really, really high profile for a year to get back. Any simultaneous submissions, but in six months, it's appropriate to query and learn about on Duotrope how long you can generally expect to wait. And if you have your work um, entered into Duotrope, this one is, you know, here's the one for Fourth River, it will up in different color once the, your submission is older, has, has you know, surpassed the, the amount of time that it's supposed to take to hear back. So that's a really nice like visual cue and you can say, okay, now it's not gonna be obnoxious for me to email Valentine Sargent and say, yo, where's my, where's my thing? But what you say is not, yo, where's my thing? You say, dear Valentine Sargent, I'm writing to inquire about the status of my submission dated, whatever the date was, and including the titles, do, 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 any information would be very uh, appreciated. Very polite, and Valentine will get back to you as soon as you can, right? Do you get these sometimes? Yeah, okay. All right. You're gonna be asked for a writer's bio. What is this thing? When you submit your work, they're gonna want you to include 50 or so words about who you are to let the editors and your eventual readers know something about you. This should always be written in third person and writers never do this. Writers always write them in first person. The reason to write them in third person is so that Valentine Sargent and other managing editors and other editors who have to put the journal together at the end of the submission cycle before production so that they can cut and paste your third person bio from your submission and put it right into the contributor's notes for the journal. If you don't give it to them in third person, they have to rewrite it. So save them that step and practice writing your bios in third person, all right? Um, this can include work information, previous publications, um, tread lightly, but you sometimes can include a little bit of um, personal information. Um, I'm gonna show you an example in a minute. Don't panic if you have no prior publications. That is not a requirement ever for any journal, right? Um, you don't need any, you don't need to pretend like you have more. You don't have to try to like amplify something that's not really a publication. Just don't do that. You can be really simple with it. So here are some examples. And I went from like most detailed to least. Sheila Squilanti directs the MFA program at Chatham University. She is the author of the poetry collections, Mostly Human and Beautiful Nerve, has published her work in journals like Copper Nickel, Bennington Review, and Thrush. She lives in Pittsburgh with her family, okay? That is plenty. It gives you a sense of who I am as a professional, where I've published my work, done. Another example, Sheila Squilanti is a poet living in Pittsburgh. She's been the recipient of a Blah Blah Award and a Woohoo Prize, not real things. Her most recent work appears in Copper Nickel. You can learn more, and there's my website. So it's, it's a similar kind of information um, dump, but you know, different details. Could be really simple. Sheila Squilanti writes poems and essays from her home in Pittsburgh, which she shares with two dogs, a bird, two rats, and a lizard, which is true. Um, you don't even have to include the information about the dogs and the lizards. You can just say, Sheila Squilanti writes poems and essays from her home in Pittsburgh. Notice I don't even include prior publications, okay? You don't have to. Just keep it professional sounding. Okay, cover letters. You're also going to be asked to include, and they're not really letters anymore because this is really the di digital age. It used to be that you had to write a business letter as a cover letter for these things. Um, but I'll show you when we get into submittable what, they, what that really looks like. Most importantly, keep it simple. Address it to the correct editor whenever possible. Okay, so if you know the name of the poetry editor, use it, full name, Dear Sheila Squilanti right? Not, hey, Sheila, especially if you don't know me. Um, don't list, oh, yeah, that should say every, don't list every award or publication you've ever gotten. We certain, I've seen them, they just scroll on forever. You don't need to impress in that moment. And I'll tell you another secret, even though, even though editors ask for cover letters, we don't read them <laughs> until 
after we make our selections often. Um, when, I when I used to teach the Fourth River, I would tell the students in that class, don't read the cover letters because why not? Because you could be, you know, you, if you get something in from somebody who's a big famous person or you read something in the cover letter that makes you think, oh, I should definitely publish this person because whatever their, you know, their bona fides are. And then the poem is terrible. <laughs> that happens. So don't read the cover letters. Read the work first. Um, if you're in that position, um, be sincere. One thing that often uh, happens in cover letters is you get a writer saying, I'm really a super fan of the Fourth River. I love what you do with nature and place based writing. Um, I especially loved, you know, Logan Henry's piece on um, the Cardinals of the North Atlantic. I don't make stuff up. That's sincere. That calls attention specifically to a writer, their piece, an issue. And it doesn't feel like, like flattery or gushing. You don't want that. Editors can, can smell insincerity from a mile away. Okay, I've done my research and I'm not a jerk. I'm ready to submit. So now I'm going to show you how to do that. Hopefully this is gonna work. Um, and I'm decided I'm going to shoot for the brass ring um, and I'm gonna submit some poems to Poetry Magazine. I do this every six months and I get my rejections every six months. Poetry is one of, is probably the most prestigious um, journal for, poet, for poets in the country. Um, but why not? Why not, right? I'll tell you a story about rejections in a bit. Okay, so Zoom, stay with me here. Let's hope this works. Okay, uh, new share. Can you see the Poetry Foundation website? Okay. So I brought you to the, to the website where you can find important notes. I've read them. I understand kind of what to expect once the submission goes forward. Um, you can read through these. You should always, always read through these. But buried in here somewhere is going to be the link to the actual submittable page. And here it is. So I'm going to go there. What is this? No, what, oh, that's what it is. That's not what I wanted, hold on, it's this one. There we go. Okay, new share. Can you see that Zoom? Okay, Poetry Magazine. So I've noted that they're having a guest editor for this um, particular period and they're asking for some specific things. And so I've looked through my poems that are available for submission and I picked out four that I think might have a shot at this. So I'm gonna scroll down here and this is what I'm submitting to, to poetry. And now it's asking me to sign, sign in to my submittable account. So I'll do that, hold on. Zoom, can you still see this? Yes, okay. So Dan, keep scrolling down and you can see it already auto-populates my personal information in Submittable because I've used it so many times before. So I can just save the address and continue. Okay, comes here. Now here's where it asks for a title and it asks for a cover letter. And then I have to fill in, I guess I have to fill in my address again, which is, Surprising, but that's okay. So I'm gonna leave this for a minute. And, oh, you know what? <laughs> I'm not gonna be able to do this because my, I was thinking that this was my own personal laptop and it's not. So I'm not gonna be able to submit this right in front of you. I apologize. I can do it tonight though, during the, um, during the, if anybody's interested. But this is basically how it works. So you put your title in and for poets, you're gonna to wanna to list the titles of every poem in your, in your packet, okay? Um, separate them by, you know, commas, it's fine. Um, if you're obviously writing if this, you're not gonna send a short story to Poetry Magazine because they do not publish them. And then this is where you have that space for the cover letter. It does have a word count. Um, it'll let you know when you're getting too many words in here, but you can see they're not expecting a huge, you know, long thing. And then sometimes there's also information like this. They want you to click, I confirm that this work 
has not been previously appeared in a, in a printer or online. Um, and then they want to know that this is interesting. If selected, this would be my first appearance in Poetry Magazine. That's kind of neat. That tells me that they are looking for emerging voices at this best journal uh, that we have as poets. So, um, and I would, get to, I would get to click that because even though I'm 50, I've never been published by poetry. Um, so you just do all of that and then you submit, you click submit. And after that, you, um, you'll get an email. You'll get an automatic email that says, thank you for your submission. Um, and you'll, it'll also show up in submittable. So submittable is another place where you can track your work. Um, and that works fine as long as everything you do goes through submittable. Not all journals use submittable. Some that are very small still use um, just Gmail or some other kind of submission manager. So that's why I prefer Duotrope. Um, let me show you though, since we're in my submittable account, I'm gonna go over here and I can go down to my user account. I have a team account up here because I am sometimes an editor for Barrel House. So if I were to click on this, you'd see all sorts of uh, submissions that came in for Barrel House. We're not gonna do that. We go down to my submissions. Okay. And you can see this is that you can toggle between all submissions, active submissions, not very many, accepted submissions, those, and declined. And again, declined is by far the longest. On and on and on. I'll pause here and tell you a story about, about rejections. My professor in undergraduate, the one who taught me to, you know, keep it going, keep it going, build the callus, was probably in his 60s when I was a student there. So he had a long career of, of writing books of poetry. He had like four or five of them. And he had been at the college for something like 20 years and they wanted to celebrate him um, in some way uh, with a, they wanted to do like a visual, like an ex exhibit of his work. And they wanted to, to show his poems, but he said, no, I don't want you to show my poems. I want you to show my rejections. So he brought in, and this was before the internet. <laughs> so he, reje rejections used to come on little slips of paper that had the, the you know, the, um, the journal's masthead on it, you know, the logo and you know, sometimes if you were very, very lucky, it would have like a handwritten note that said, sorry. And you would hold that to your, your heart and say, oh, it's a good rejection. I'm so happy. <laughs> um, there is such a thing as a good rejection. It's the one that says, hey, we, we like your, your voice, your style. This is not right for us right now, but try us again. So my professor brought in shoe boxes, like six of them stuffed with these paper slips. And that's what they used for the reject for the exhibit in the library, just rejections spilling out of boxes. And I love, I love that because it's real. It's, it tells you exactly what you're up against as a writer, but it's also inspiring because it shows the length of time he has committed to this work. And now there's a, you know, if you, if you're on social media, there are, at least on Facebook, there are groups that you can join that strive to have a hundred rejections a year. Like this is a goal that you should try to get a hundred rejections a year. And that's just a kind of a funny way of saying, send your stuff out a hundred times a year, you know? So, so that's what Submittable looks like. Um, Submittable also has, oh, something went wrong, it said. That's always nice. <laughs> Submittable also has, um, and I guess I can't get back to it, um, but you can look at, you can poke around there. They also have a um, uh, kind of like do a trope, but you can't, I don't know if you can search for, um, for venues, but it's got a list of like calls for submission and places. So I don't know why I can't see it. Maybe if I go back, hmm, let's see. Yeah, okay, if you go up to, to discover. And it'll give you, I guess you can search. Okay, my bad. So you could put, so search your poetry and then there are tags you can pick um, and do it that way. And it'll like show you if you wanna send poetry to the big whoopee deal, it ends in five hours, get on it, okay? So lots and lots and lots of off, um, of, of really easy to access um, resources for you out there. Okay, let's um, go back to this, um, share and 
do share. Right, this. Zoom, can you see that? We're back to PowerPoint. Okay, so that part didn't work exactly like I hoped, but we talked about keeping track. Um, what if you get rejected? I just said, you're gonna get rejected. So it's the bread and butter of our chosen vocation, but if you build the callus up, it will hurt less and less. Um, remember that if one editor rejects your story, just go to another, try another. If more than one editor rejects the same story, it might be a cue for you to pull that story back and look at it carefully again. Is it really ready? Does it need revision? Have your trusted friend give you some feedback on it again, and then go back out with it, okay? Remember that rejection is not personal. It can mean a lot of things. It can mean we already have an essay about polar bears for this particular issue. We don't need two. It can mean we simply don't have enough room for all the excellent work we did get. It can mean the voice and tone weren't a good fit for this particular issue. It can mean we don't publish haiku and you sent a haiku, or it can, it can mean we only publish haiku and you sent me you know, a graphic novel. Don't do that either. Um, this is not in the slides. I choose in the back. Portal. If that happens, you look back. You have to publish until you are ready. And I know that when you're in an MFA program, it can feel like there's competition, it's healthy competition. Um, and there's an energy and a buzz, but you don't have to race anybody and you can go at your own pace, right? Um, on the other hand, don't hang on to something. Don't get so attached to it and worry over it so much to make it so perfect that you never let it go, right? Even published work can probably be revised again. And oftentimes it is revised again between the time it hits a journal and it hits a book, right? Um, and again, I talked about the, the good rejection. So when an editor tells you, please send more work, listen to them. They mean it. They do not say it if they don't mean it. Because again, editors get too many. There's so much to read. Why would they want more if they didn't really want it? So, and this is specifically, I'm speaking now to um, women and women identified people. You especially, me especially, talking to myself, there are statistics that, say, that show that when men and male-identified people get this kind of um, encouragement, they go immediately back to their computers and they send something right back out. The rest of us, we go back to our computers and say, oh, I don't know. Do they really want this? I don't know. And we sit on it for six months or we never send anything. So get in the habit of believing in that the, the editor is not going to ask for it unless they want it. Okay, that is the end of the slides. So I'm going to stop the share. I already see there are seven things in the chat. Um, and I want to see if any of these are questions. Um, okay, this is all a conversation. Okay, so chat people, people in front of me, what questions? Because, so I'll use an example from the Fourth River. Um, we had, there is a writer named Justin Maxwell. I'll just call him out. He has been published in the Fourth River probably five or six times. And every time his work comes across the desk and I see it, I'm delighted because I know his work. His work is a very good fit for the Fourth River always. And it feels like we're creating a relationship with him. We have a relationship with Justin Maxwell. And when his book comes out, we are definitely going to review it and we're definitely going to celebrate it. Um, so that is one reason to submit your work to the, more, to the same journal more than once. Wasteful, like, what do you think is wasteful about that? Because you want to be spreading your work around. Looks more impressive. 
Sure. So Matt's saying that it looks more impressive to say you've been published in like seven different places as opposed to just one. I think you just have to, it depends on where you are in your writing, in your writing life, right? I mean, if you're a brand new writer, brand new submitter, it might be really important to you to do that, to get that kind of um, variety out there. But once you, once you find your people, once you find the journals that really support your writing, you want to support them too. It really is a relationship. Does that, is that answer? Okay. Um, okay. I see a question that Anna is asking. What are your thoughts on submitting under a pen name? Wow. That's an interesting question. Um, I know that this is sort of conventional practice for a lot of genre writers, like in romance and horror and erotica and whatnot. Um, I, it's hard for me to answer this question, Anna, because I'm an academic. And if I publish under a pen name, I don't get any credit for that towards tenure or whatever. So um, that's, for me, it would be a no. But on the other hand, I know that there are good reasons, you know, you might not want notoriety. It might be more important that you get the content out into the world as like public service, like maybe you're want to express it to someone who needs All right, I'm going to bounce back and forth. Logan. Um, but in a certain way, yourself as a writer saying, you know, even if you know of the writer and saying, this is who I am. This is who I aspire to be. Um, and again, always start with the higher tier and work your way down instead of doing that split focus thing I was talking about before. Um, having said that, do a Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Okay, I have an insider for you who's in the chat right now. So Karen Coyazzo is out is saying that she did the thing where you send to the journal you really want to go to, dip your toe in the water, and then freak out. And um, Kim, this is for you. She sent a brevity and brevity sent back a, you know, an encouraging rejection. And again, and she didn't. It was last fall. And the question is, is it too late to return to that? I don't know. I see Kim's face, but I don't know if Kim's actually in here. Kim's an assistant editor of brevity. Kim, are you there? You could type it into the chat. My answer is no, it's not too late. Nope. And Kim says, no, put it in the cover letter. Put it in the cover letter. Say, thank you. Right? Uh, we want you to submit again, Kim says. Okay. <laughs> Aren't you glad you asked? Okay. All right. Let me see I, who I have in the, next in the chat. We have Lori. Okay. Lori, what if you submit your work to several places that do not use submittable and you get accepted by one of them? How do you withdraw your work from the other journals? Okay. Great question. Um, then in that case, if they do not use submittable, I would go right to their website um, and find, and sometimes they have an email that is separate from their submissions that says to withdraw work, use this email address, but you can just use the general email address for the, for the press or the, uh, the journal and just have it in your email subject line, withdrawing work so that it's very, very clear. Okay, Lori. Okay. All right. I see Arista. Good question. Arista is asking if it's worth um, being to the writing contests that journals often hold. I'm going to say yes. And the reason for that is um, you get, there's a bigger return on your investment. So sometimes those, those come with a higher 
reading fee, like $15 maybe, because oftentimes they're using that to pay the honorarium of a prestigious judge. And if you win something like that, you have the attention of the prestigious judge at, at the same time as you have a nice publication. So that's one reason why it might be, be a good thing to do. I also, and I don't have statistics to back this up, but my sense is that fewer people submit to the contest than they do to the open reading calls for the journals. So you might have a, there might be a slight edge in terms of, you know, possibility there, right? But again, that's money. And I really, again, wanna strongly recommend that you all think about creating a budget for yourselves, a monthly budget or a yearly budget. And this is how I'm gonna spend money. And um, think that it's a way of like making it outside of your ego and yourself and just letting it move along. Okay. Um, oh, Kim is saying, true, I read for a contest and we get around 50 submissions as opposed to I'm guessing hundreds for a, a regular journal issue, maybe even more than hundreds, I don't know. Brevity gets a lot. Okay, um, Kyle is asking, what do we do with those pieces we love that have been getting consistently rejected for years? Put them to rest, revise them again. Oh, Kyle, first of all, I know how this feels. And I'm gonna say, keep, I'm, keep going with them. Um, I'm gonna say, if you really feel like you have revised that To I know. Um, despair. I'm never gonna find a place for this. But I knew it was a good essay, and it is a good essay, and I believed in it, and eventually it found a home. So that's my answer. Okay. Let's see. Oh gosh, brevity gets three thousand five hundred submissions every year and, and only what only 50 for the contest. So that, there you go. That shows you. All right, other questions. What is, we still have one minute, one more question. Natalie. <laughs> Actually, um, I mean, I don't I did. I knew an essay. I just honestly, the Zeit journals are interested in politics. You're just not hitting it at the right moment, you know. And my essay was: I write quiet work. I write about life and relationships, and sometimes that's so. Sometimes you have to wait out the trend and have it come back around, right? Okay, um, okay, one more question from Mary Moses. If you're writing a collection, is it okay to send individual stories to journals or should you submit as a whole? I'm so glad you asked this question, Mary. Okay, poets in the room, listen, you want to submit, if you have a manuscript, like your thesis, right? Or your first poetry manuscript that you want to be a book, your goal is to send out and get as many of those poems published in journals as possible before your book is published. Nonfiction writers do not do that. It is the opposite for you. You want to have only one or maybe two essays from your collection before you have a book. And it's a different kind of process and we can talk. I love the hard way, folk. And Um, I